who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonder Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hey, I'm Fenton Bailey, uh, co-founder of World of Wonder. Joining me this week on the uh, top 10 things that made us go wow. 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 Of course, there is Jane St. James. You've been away lately. I know I have, I, but I'm back now. I'm I back, know. baby. You look refreshed oh, and rested. Um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a very special guest today, straight in at number 10. Number 10. Michael Fazakli. Michael Fazakli you are an artist, a photographer. An icon of we, the Club Kid era. I'm revisiting it. <laughs> you, you go back like taxes, right? I do. To the last, the last century. I do. We all go back. I mean, I think I met you 30 years ago, and, and James probably around the same time. And yeah, um, you know, because you were a club kid, you you were a photographer back then. I mean, right. You're still a photographer now, but you were really. um, the club kid photographer for about 10 years, probably at least. Uh, and, and actually, I covered all the scenes. I covered the boys scene, the leather scene, the yeah. black party scene, the drag queen scene, the boy bar beauties. All of that was kind of. So I kind of cornered the market on it. On so this everybody. was like 80s New York, right? 80s, late, 90s. Late 80s. And what, to, to early what made 90s. you spark to the club kids? Because I feel they were like some of your most memorable pictures. Yes. You know, all the ones that seem to capture people's imagination. Well, I, I did do photography for about eight years before that. and But I was doing like models portfolios and uh, think some, some small uh, press kit stuff for fashion companies right out of FIT. And... Um, Michael Economy and I, with friends, started Pansy Beat magazine. I love Michael uh, Economy. The, fa the, fan yes. the fanzine Pansy Beat. We started that in. Um, I just got the book. In eighty, probably it was like late eighty eight, and then it, it published for all of eighty nine and and most of ninety. And um, short lived fanzine, but it has a, every every page yes. was a work of art. Yes. Yeah. It was very well done. Um, you know, we all we all drove each other crazy towards the end, but we all actually are all of our careers advanced because of it. Um, and uh, we moved on b b uh, into other venues. Um, and how I got into the club kid things, I was doing some things already with um, HX. Right. I, was, I was working with HX, oh, who, yes. who had just started up. Right. And I went to meet Matthew at his, where we were staying. And HX he, was a was, gay ads rag, It was basically. literally a fold out yeah. in the beginning. So I went and I took in some sexy boy pictures and he said, great, I'll use them for covers. And um, that evolved and at the same time, we photographed um, Michael Alec for Pansy Beach. We did a little feature story. I remember that. A yeah. little feature story on him. He was actually the centerfold, and him and Clara the chicken, Ernie was in the costume. And uh, we did that, and um, Michael paid for the whole issue, or Peter Gation paid for the whole issue of that month because they ran a big ad and everything like that. And uh, after that, we kind of started a little romance, and he said, come and take pictures for the club, and he knew I, he found out I lived a block from Limelight, so he was just shipping kids over fresh before they went to the clubs and start, started taking pictures. Well, I remember because you did a lot of the, um, the Club Kid, you did uh, all three series of the Club Kid cards. There was three, There were, we did two series of the Disco 2000 ones, they're right. different graphics, mm -hmm. and then we did um, a raver. Card. Oh, right, right, Ra right. Raver right. cards. Oh, the Raver ones were so cute. I missed Ra all those yeah. little Raver cards. I don't think they got printed as many as, as the other right. ones. Yeah. But, um, yeah, then we did three series of them. Well, so, but yeah. now you are revisiting this again. You are doing a, a gallery show here at the World of Wonder store from Gallery. Am. Yeah, just opened last night at yes. the World of Wonder Gallery. What an amazing opening it was. It's wonderful. I'm so happy to be here, actually. Um, yes, I had a show in... Um, uh, Wilt Manor's Fort Lauderdale, where, where James grew up, where yeah. James grew up, <laughs> and uh, where I currently live. It's a beautiful little gay mecca in, in South Florida, and uh, we have a museum there called the Stonewall National Museum and Archives, which, strangely enough, being in Florida, is actually one of the largest um, LGBTQ history um, archives of movies, films, books, and actual artwork and mm. artifacts that were handed us from celebrities and things. And that's been around for 45 years. So I went to the museum when I moved there and um, they had a, um, they were showing a naked civil servant and they show oh, movies yeah, sometimes sure. in there. Quentin so Crisp. I, yeah, so I knew I had a picture of Quentin so I said, I'm gonna take the picture of Quentin in there. So I took it in and I gave it to them and uh, to donate it to them and the director said, mm. what else do you got? Let's see your work. I met him and he said, let's do a show and I said, okay and he got me a grant and funding and we did this huge show. 
And it, uh, that's the it one that I well, saw. Re- it was very well received. Yeah. Now, what was it like? Was James was photographing James St. James your favorite? <laughs> uh, was he your favorite subject? Was he a model? Model? Just say yes. Just say yes. Um, James was always great. I have a lot of different pictures <laughs> of, of James. I watched James. Um, on the roller coaster for a little while. <laughs> yeah, um, well, yeah. I have some favorites, but I don't, you know, I don't like to call them out. But there are a few favorites. Well, uh, you know, one of my favorites that I just saw when I because I, I haven't, I, I didn't really want to give a, a, a go in, and I wanted to be shocked when I came in. So, um, but I saw the queer Donna picture, and yeah. that just queer made me queer Donna. And Donna. you know who I don't have in here, and I should find her. I have Stephanie um, Strawberry. I love Stephanie Strawberry. She, she's in the book. She's in the book, uh, but I don't know if she's in the show. I have to. I don't know everything hey, got Whatever happened to Stephanie Strawberry? Uh, Kenny says she's still around. God and probably bless her. Cha- and probably did the change. God, and so is, yeah. so is Jacqueline. Oh, yeah. Mm. Who was your favorite, uh, most shocking memory of shooting the Club Kids? I loved Kabuki, and I, I, I see why he went to where he went with his career. He was amazing. Um, you know, there was a time where he came over to my house, and it wasn't even an assignment for Michael, and... He painted himself gold, and, and I remember that it picture. took yeah. hours. And I said, "I'm just going to leave and come back." And he was in my house for like six hours, getting ready, <laughs> getting getting ready. But the picture shows gorgeous, it, it? Yeah. gorgeous. You know, and um, I, 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 that was a good Kide one. And uh, uh, yeah, some. Of I that. always thought uh, that all of the oh now if Astro Earl gave good pictures, right? They Astro were, always had really good costumes for sure. Yes. Right. He, I have a lot of pictures of him in the show here. Yeah. Um, he always had his looks changed drastically. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's still around. Yo, I saw him yeah. last time in Tompkins Square Park. Last well, look, time. Stay with us because we're gonna like keep on counting down things that made us go. Wow, wow. that's the trademark oh, of the sorry. show. Wow, wow, wow. 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 So that's that's uh, Nightbirds is open here at the Wow Gallery and runs until. May 2nd, so come see the show. And the book is out. And you should chime in on this, because my number nine pick... Number nine. Last time I was in New York uh, the other week, and I went to see this thing called The Vessel. Have you heard about The Vessel at Hudson Yards? It's uh, The Hudson Yards is the new sort of centerpiece real estate, multi-billion dollar development. It looks like a beehive. Is it on on the South Street Seaport? Uh, no, it's actually Midtown. It's where oh, the yeah. where the rail yards used to be, oh, like sort of near the, near the no, sort of Penn Station. Isn't it right across the street from uh, the uh, where we have DragCon? It the is very near the convention center. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. around this square is this thing called the Vessel, which actually was designed by a fellow Brit, uh, Thomas Heatherick, actually a fellow Brit. What is the material? Because like, it's it just metal? staircases. It's something yeah. like 145 interlocking <laughs> staircases. <laughs> And that's all you do. You just climb the staircases and look Life out. Why is waiting for someone to push someone off the Is there an base. elevator? <laughs> the day I was there, it was incredibly windy. And actually, if and you were no wearing wind, the wrong no outfit, you could have just been picked up and well, sort of no swept ceiling, away. There's no ceiling, right? There's no ceiling, no. It's yeah. kind of open. It does yeah. look like a, like a, a modern beehive. vase or a beehive, yes. It's a really weird concept. It's got a vessel, but obviously it contains nothing. And, and there's been a lot of very... Mm, what's the word? Uh, it's not snide, but uh, snarky. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of snarky commentary about how, you know, this is Trumpism at its most grotesque. Because yes. it's, just, it's just a stack of staircases with sort of glitzy copper Is it cladding dedicated on them. to anything? Like, no, like, I think you know, the world it's basically it should be dedicated to Instagram because that's uh, all it's really <laughs> good for. Well, I wonder if um, some in 50 years we're going to look back on it and just groan and say, God, what were we thinking back then? It just seemed like sort of that... Like, well, you know it. Or she could be the new Statue of Liberty. Or the new <laughs> Eiffel Tower. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, it was only supposed to cost like something like $75 million, which is quite a lot of money for some yeah. staircases. But because it was so complicated to build, it ended up costing two hundred million. How many floors high do you million. think? How many floors high? It's like fourteen floors. Oh, and, hello. Um, Who's walking that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is. Uh, they did a neat thing, or a sort of particularly evil thing, which is that the corporation owns every photo you take that features oh, it, uh, or every photo you take are doing on that it. Now, yes. Which is, it, uh, and they've sort of since retreated from that IP grab. But it's, it symbolizes this. I think people, by and large, are quite negative about it. They think it's like just Instagram, superficial, Disney kind greedy. Of, Disney kind of does that now, too. Oh, really? Well, you can pay into it, but you'll, if you do their app, you know, like all the pictures, they actually will take pictures of you as you're on rides and know it's you and send them to you. Oh, wow. It's crazy. And then you have to pay for them if you want them, right? I think you have to pay for the app to be start with. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah. But I think... Um, 
It's quite irresistible. I mean, the tickets are free. It's irresistible. It's worth, you know, half an hour of your time. And, um, <laughs> a bunch of high-end stores that are... Yeah. I, you wonder, though. I have to say, it is a lot of high-end stores with nobody in them. I, I wonder what's happening to retail. The idea of these stores, they just become exhibition spaces. There's No one's really buying anything well, you know, in stores at the anymore. Center here, they did this massive, massive yeah. re, re, remodeling of it. Yeah. And they put in, you know, Gucci and Prada and everything yeah. like that. But they have one handbag and one pair of shoes <laughs> and not one person is in the entire mall right. anymore. It's so it's, weird. It is it's very crazy. strange. They end up being these interactive spaces, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the vessel at Hudson Yards. You can visit it in Chelsea. You get more information, advance tickets, blah, blah, blah. Hudson Yards, New York.com. Uh, James, what have you got number eight? Number eight. Um, on FX, they have a new series called What We Do in the Shadows, and it's based on— Did you see it? I did not, but I'm ah. going back to see it now because it's based on a New Zealand mockumentary, indie yes. vampire mockumentary done by Taika Watiti. Taika Watiti, who did uh, all Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, Thor Ragnarok, which is one of your favorite movies it of is. all time. Absolutely. I watched it because you told me to watch it. It's absolutely spectacular. It He's really so is. good. They also did, um, it's also Jamie. Uh, oh, Jermaine Clement, I think, who was behind uh, Flight of the Concords. Yeah, that yeah. was yeah. He he used to write the songs and produce and yes. direct those. So it's got a really great uh, uh, sort of what's the provenance? Provenance, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and even if Never your first reaction really? yeah. is like, oh, I mean, is this 2009? We have done vampires to death. You know, they really they really put a new spin on it. It's really funny. It's four vampires living in a house in uh, Staten Island, and they're supposed to take over the world, but they're pretty inept. Um, one of them set is... Set in today's... Set in today. Oh, okay. And one of them is a mental vampire, which means he just, like, is so tedious that he just bores people to death. We know some of those. <laughs> we know. Every <laughs> office has a few <laughs> mental vampires. And it's, um, it's really funny, but then... Uh, one of the great things is they keep instead of you know doing flashbacks, they use old uh, wood cuttings from the 1700s and 1800s, and they use old like illustrations from books at the time. And th when they're telling stories, that's what they flash back like to. Like shadows, almost shadowing. S sort of, but like just like. Like animated, animated, a bit. not um, not even animated. They just use like a picture from like <laughs> a, a like a, a 17th century book about super the supernatural or something. And it's, I, I'm thinking of going into the Escape Hotel across the street. Have you been? No, I'm no. scared. I can't do those Let's things. Do I'm it. claustrophobic. Oh, please. You scared die. plenty of people in your life. <laughs> <laughs> what did that place used to be across the street from well, our studio? It was um, uh, our boy. Um, yeah, Wilma's it, restaurant. It, it, Wilmer but I can't and remember Ashton what it was called. Yeah, and it was um. Uh, it had an Asian theme to it, remember? Geisha House. Geisha Thank House. You. Geisha yes. House. We had a Christmas party there one time. It was chic beyond chic. Yes, very much so. They so used anyway, to show it all the time on the hills. <laughs> <laughs> but I do just, um, what we do in the shadows, it's just sort of interesting and fun. It's it's not something you have to like do obsessively, but just sort of dip You're in You're a little low-key about it. You're not like... I'm just, mm. just low-key today. Is it, on, just, is it on Netflix or something? No, it's on, it's on uh, FX. FX. Okay. Yeah. Wednesdays, okay. 10 p.m. on FX? Okay. Yes. Look, brand new episodes of RuPaul's Drag Race every Thursday, Hello. 9 p.m. VH1 and on Wow Presents Plus. And stay for Untucked, because if you aren't watching Untucked, Blake? You're only getting half the story. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> what is Wow Presents Plus, I hear you ask? It's our very own streaming service, Michael. Wonderful. Yeah. Are you still uh, plugging? Up. What do you do? How many more plugs do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see 101 Red Boys back up. Uh, then you need Wow Presents Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Only $3.99 a month and less than the price of a latte or even a handjob from a Red Boy. <laughs> is, it, is a shockumentary on there too? Uh, shock, yes, it's all there. Wonderful. Some of the greatest Wonderful. gems of documentary filmmaking okay. ever made. All Wonderful. right. Anything else? No, you're listening to the Wow Report. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to ask you. Just a, just a little blur. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hey, welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm uh, Fenton Bailey, uh, joined by literary sensation editor of the Wow Report, James St. James. Hello, darling. Hello, hello, hello. And we were just chatting with Michael Fazakli. Photographer, artist, kind of like famous, I guess, for documenting the club kids, right, yes, James? Yes, the Boswell of the night. There you go. He took lots of photos of you. Yes, I remember. back in the day, back sure. In the day. And now, Michael, uh, the reason being Michael is here in L.A. 
his show Nightbirds is showing at the World of Wonder gallery space. Very exciting. You need mm. to check it out. Come and see it. We're on Hollywood Boulevard. And Michael is now magically transformed into Blake. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and we are counting down the top 10 things that made us go. Wow. wow. We have reached number seven. Number seven. Okay. Number seven. Uh, did you see Free Solo? No, I can't. It's terrifying. <laughs> it really upsets me and it makes me break out in hives. I've just... only, I watched this like documentary about Jeff Os- Jack Osborne climbing on, and I literally had sweaty palms. Yeah, right. imagine that. I don't understand it. Well, Free Solo won won the Oscar, and you can when you watch it, you can see why. Because I had no idea that this kind of climbing even existed but yeah. free solo as the name might suggest is when you climb impossible mountains and rock faces with nothing no no rope no clamps no climbing boots just shorts and a t-shirt and a little little itty bigger bucket of uh, chalk dust that you rub your fingers in and then stick them into these like crevices and, and what holes happens if you get three-fourths the way up and there's no crevasses right? for you to what do you do you fall off and you plummet all the way and to a pe- certain death. But do are people plummeting all the time? Or People are plummeting all the time. I mean, free solo is the most dangerous kind of climbing. And there's this guy, Alex Penhold, who does it. And he's an extraordinary character, probably on the spectrum. And a, a sort of sub-theme of the documentary is his relationship with his girlfriend. He doesn't actually have a girlfriend at the beginning, but then she gets introduced and all along, he's explicitly clear that he prefers mountains to girls. And it's a strangely sort of, you, it's not that he's an asshole. He just doesn't have that sort of, he talks, it, it, as a kid, he was bullied. And he talks about this really moving moment where he talks about, I noticed that humans hug. So I decided to learn how to it's hug. very uh, spectrum. It, right, yeah. right. But he loves to climb. Matt, uh, the one thing I'll say about free solo is what you do on the most dangerous slopes is you climb it traditionally map out a route figure it out and then stick to it so it isn't like you are going blind as oh, it were okay, yeah. i mean you can do that but i think that is almost a way to die yeah yeah you know? well and then another interesting thing about it is um the beautiful drone footage of when you see just these the, the going up the mountain oh. and then you know swinging all around him and everything like that and i would imagine if you didn't have absolute concentration yes. the fact that this drone is You're buzzing like, all <laughs> around you would be what would bo- it was great. Well, it, because the camera crew are all professional climbers. So they're not just mm. a camera crew. And they are mindful of the fact that they're filming a colleague and in many cases a friend who could plunge to his death in front of yeah. their eyes. And they're anxious about the interference aspect of the cameras. Yeah. You know, because we all know that when a camera's pointed at something, it changes the thing that it's, it's observing. Totally, yeah. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating. But the other film I really recommend, if you can watch Free Solo... Then go watch Valley Uprising, which is the history of climbing in Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. And it begins with them going up the Half Dome. And I think the first time they did it, it took something like 46 weeks to climb it. And in the end, Alex Penhold's climbing it in like three hours. Oh, my gosh. And the way the sport has evolved. And you also have um, Speed Free Solo, where they're basically racing. And then there's also um, Flying Monkeys, where... It's a little less dangerous in the sense that you're completely free solo, but you have a parachute on your back oh. so that if you fall or you, you can... just get to the top and then you jump and you. But can... it, it essentially with um, parachutes, you have to be at a certain height. Otherwise, you it's, not, it's not going to open in time. Open in time. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's also these things like um, I think that's maybe oh, the, what the, 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 yes, yes. the suit, the, the, the flying sort of... squirrel suit. <laughs> exactly. Yes. yes. I really think you should watch it. And it's, you, you think th- I should do it? Do you think we should um, all do it? We no. Have a, a climbing day, an exercise at World of Wonder where everyone has to climb up a mountain? That no. flying squirrel suit does look fun. I don't know. <laughs> That's sort of scary, because though. Because you are going down at a hell of a rate. I mean, oh, it looks yeah. like you're flying, but actually you're falling through the air at like 30 <laughs> feet a second. Yeah. You know. Um, it's pretty great. I, I, I mean, they're both... Uh, Did wait, you see actually, it in iMac? Did you see it in a big screen? No, I saw it on Netflix. I, um, did you watch it on your phone? But I watched it on my Kindle, so <laughs> but I was really close to the screen. <laughs> no, I imagine seeing it in a yeah, theater. I was going to say, is yeah. Just, I'm surprised they even show it on airplanes, because I think just the idea of being in an airplane watching free... So it's not the right thing to no. show on a plane. Anyway, 
Free Solo, Valley Uprising, they're both, one of them's on Hulu, one's on Netflix, I, I forget which. James, what have you got for us at number six? Number six. Um, I watched, I've been watching Love, Death, and Robots. Yeah, right? I saw an amazing poster campaign. Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, it's on Netflix. It is uh, a new anthology series of experimental animation, sort of in the vein of Liquid Television back in the 80s, if you recall, one of the great, you know, fabulous shows on MTV. Um, it's 18 science fiction short films, each in a different style of animation, produced uh, by David Fincher. Um, so it's sort of got, once again, a nice provenance to it. <laughs> um, it's sort of, think Black Mirror, where it's like sort of twist endings, and uh, it's very, um, lots of nudity and violence and sex and chilling existential concepts. And, oh, what's the sex like? Uh, it's, um, it's sort of hot if you're into animation, <laughs> animated sex. But do you see organs and things? You do, yeah, <laughs> you see all sorts of stuff. You know, there's all sorts of crazy deaths, and it's very violent. Um, two of my favorites, um, they're, each, they're all under 20 minutes. Some of them are shorter than you know, five minutes or three minutes. Um, the best is called Three Robots, and it's like done in a Wally style. Of, and it's three robots wandering a post-apocalyptic Earth, and they're trying to figure out what humanity was because they have no clue. And mm -hmm. they see like a basketball, and they're like, what do you do with it? And then the one robot says, well, you bounce it. And it's like... He sort of like drops it and about and he's like, yeah, so what? And then like they find like uh, like some food and they're like, what? They put it in them and then it turns into a, a acid and then they push it back out again. What is that? Like it make like nothing makes any sense to them at all. And then they find a cat and they're like just they're freaked out by the cat. And then you uh, there's a twist ending. Should I tell you what? The oh, twist? you go on spoiler alert. Oh, yeah, well, if you don't want to hear it, turn there, it off. There's the twist ending of of how the Earth was destroyed. And oh, was it to do with the cat? <laughs> yes. It's to do with the yes, it's stepped on the nuclear button. There's a um, kitty in the White House. <laughs> and then the other one is just, it's a five minute one. It's called When the Yogurt Took Over. And it's about a sentient bowl of yogurt <laughs> who, uh, and, who can solve all of Earth's problems. And so he does. And then he finds humani humans boring. And so he takes off into space and goes off into the universe to solve the universe's problems and it's just so bizarre and so weird there's um a couple there's like a fight club one that's um it's really dark and really depressing and scary how many are there they're 18 oh that's a lot and yeah it's just like one season or one yeah series it's just one series so far but um it's it's just fascinating and it's um it's a good way to spend an afternoon mm -hmm. All right, so that's uh, Love, uh, Death, and uh, Robots currently streaming on Netflix. You know Netflix are negotiating to buy the American Cinematique up, up the street here oh, on fun. Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah. And what will they do with it? I think they're sort of trying to do some sort of good work, so we could win some sort of brownie points in Hollywood so that Hollywood will embrace mm -hmm. them. I think that's That sounds about right. Yeah. Netflix is just taking over everything. I Except know. I've heard that they've um, that they're outspending at, at a greater pace than what they're get what they're getting back, and that it's about all to collapse on them. I wonder what the algorithm has to say about that. Right? <laughs> where, <laughs> where is the American Cinematique? It's theater. just like two. It's the Egyptian theater. It's oh, literally the two blocks theater. away from yeah. World of Wonder here on Hollywood but Boulevard. That is, but but that could backfire on them too because the Egyptian is such a a landmark and it's such a beloved that if right. they screw with it in any way maybe maybe they need more parking and they're just going to tear it down and turn oh, it into a parking lot it's been there since the 1920s yeah. one of my friends always talks about the Warner Theater that's around here somewhere oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're like why don't they just restore that and and use that instead of taking over the Egyptian. Well, there's a great one further down Hollywood Boulevard with those two pylons on top that's like from the era and it's all boarded up it's still i bet it looks you're talking great about the inside. old spaghetti factory I don't think so. Is, <laughs> <laughs> is it that one that says like 10,000 strip, gorgeous strippers and yeah. three oh, yes. I think it sells cheap suits as well. Like yeah. 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 Oh, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Sure. Yeah, legendary. What do we got for number five, Blake? Number five. Well, I went to see Pet Cemetery the other day. Now, I'm fascinated in this because. I think it's one of his lesser uh, stories and one of his lesser movies, but people are raving about this. Well, I will agree with you. 
like um, it, the original, well, the novel came out in 83, or was it a short story? Well, it was a novel, but it seemed like it should have been a short story <laughs> because they just stretched it. It's like Cujo, where it's like 900 pages of a dog barking at a window, and you're like, would you just get on with it, for Christ's sake? <laughs> well, this was the the movie which he wrote the screenplay for in 1989 came out and all of my friends I remember being scared of this but I never was no. really scared of Is it about pets coming back to life? Yes. Yes. It's like the monkey's paw, right? That old just well, not where but, you but know. But then he, when when uh, it's now spoiler alert because it's sort spoiler of canon now. But um, uh, well, I mean, you the, 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 the child dies, and so they go to the pet cemetery to bring the child back. But it, what the famous line is: sometimes they come back different. Yeah, because right. they don't come back. But that's like the monkey's paw, isn't yes. it? Well, yes. they like the magical monkey's paw, and they bring back the son. Yes, died. They, don't and they the, just hear the, 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 the sort of zombie feet dragging? Yeah. On the well, yes. that does sound a lot like Pet Cemetery. Yeah, huh? yeah. But mm. um, I would actually enjoyed it better than I thought I would. I, had you seen I, the original? I had seen the original, although it was a, like, I, I literally don't think I've seen it since 1992. Right. But um, I don't remember liking it, and I really liked this one more than I thought I would. And another interesting note, they ch- switched the kids. Like in the original, they're Gage and Emmy. Mm-hmm. And in the original, Gage is the toddler and he gets hit by the truck yeah. truck, and comes back to life as like a zombie toddler. Well, this time the toddler lives, but the, the older kid and, and Stephen King talked to them and okayed the decision and said... Does that make it scarier? Was there a reason for I think for it, it makes it lazier. I think it makes it easier. Yeah, because he cause even the, said... The idea of a, of a scary toddler, toddler is sort of more interesting you to You just me don't want to have to deal with the toddler on set, right? Like, uh, So it's easier to oh deal boy. with the Now, kid. you know, that original toddler from the original movie um, was such a cute little kid, and he has grown up to be quite a hunk. I saw him recently. He <laughs> was he was a b- really famous child actor when I was a kid. He was also on Full House a lot. He was one of Michelle's friends. Yeah. He was in Kindergarten Cop oh, with yeah, Arnold sure. Schwarzenegger. Uh-huh. He was in uh he was in like one of the Freddy Krueger movies where but the original when Hel- Heather Logan the comes back, come back, is, is, came back, yeah. She played her so- his son. Her well, son. he is now in his thirties and just as handsome as can be. He has a, and the little toddler <laughs> in the new one kinda looked like him. I wondered I wanted to look like check the check and see if like maybe it was his kid or uh, something, maybe. but yeah. um, I would recommend it. I guess. Oh, you would recommend it. Yeah, it seemed like I mean, you weren't recommending it. Well, I mean, maybe wait until it comes out at Redbox or. <laughs> wait, does Redbox still exist? <laughs> yeah, it does. No, it does not. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It's, everything is streaming we, now. Why would you go and get a physical copy of a DVD? I don't even have a DVD player anymore. We watched um, Into the Spider Verse rented from the Redbox the other day. Have you guys seen that? I have. I love it. I love it. Didn't yeah. it win one of the, an Academy Award? I Awards? think animated I think Philip Ward yeah. uh, got the Academy Award. I love Philip Ward so much. Mm. He's the director. Oh, did yeah. Sunny with a Chance of Meatballs. He oh. did 21 oh. Jump Street. And and he did. James runs into him, and it, well, he you accosted him eating I a sandwich. Did, I did. Um, he, I, when he was writing Twenty One Jump Street, he was at a restaurant, and I saw him, and I said, "That is the cutest boy I've ever seen." And I said, "Do you mind <laughs> if I film you eating your sandwich?" And he said, "No, go ahead, whatever." <laughs> and then we um, put it on Wow Teacup as the cutest boy in the world eats a sandwich. And you didn't know who it was? No, I had oh no idea. God. And then he went on uh, to become the And now famous. he's an Oscar winner. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I do have good taste. <laughs> <laughs> Pet Cemetery is in theaters now. Okay, question. Because we got to take a quick break. What is the question, Blake? I have a question. <laughs> okay, I guess question. The cat in Pet Cemetery is named after this historical figure who Pet Cemetery actor John Lithgow recently played on The Crown, your favorite TV show. Oh, oh. that's so easy. Dear God. Do you have another? We had another question, too. We'll, we'll answer that one, but we'll ask the other question. Okay, too. okay, so okay. We- the idea behind Netflix came in 1997 after the CEO was charged a $40 late fee for a VHS copy of what movie? Oh, I bet. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. While we're thinking the answers to those two tantalizing questions, let me tell you that the documentary Trixie Mattel, Moving Parts, will be premiering at the Tribeca Film Festival on Thursday, April 25th. Tickets available at TribecaFilm.com and also international premiere at Hot Dogs Toronto, Saturday, April 27th. Tickets at hotdogs.ca. 
And the reason I mention that is, uh, well, one that we're executive producers of mm -hmm. this amazing documentary. It's, it's, it's really good. It's the story of Trixie and Katya. It's and if you didn't know, Trixie was season three winner of All Stars. That's correct. Yes. That's correct. And just quite a hoot, huh? Yeah, she's a hoot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy, Sirius XM. We'll be right back. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Blake and James. And Tom sadly is away on top secret when assignment. When will Tom be back? When do we get him back? He'll be back not next week, but the next. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, so I do miss him. Me too. Me too. He's, uh, he, I can tell you one thing, he's in the UK. He's in England, in the old country. <laughs> <laughs> My tribal homelands. <laughs> okay, so we had two questions for the break. Uh, the first one I think is a little bit easy, and that was... Well, probably not for kids, though. Oh, okay, right. That's, Which that's our makes, audience. Yeah, I was going to say, mix up the, uh, <laughs> the lion's share of our listeners. My millennial brothers and sisters. All right. <laughs> the cat in Pet Cemetery is named after this historical figure, who Pet Cemetery actor John Lithgow recently played on The Crown. It was the John Lithgow thing that gave it yeah, away, right? With Winston, Winston Churchill. Yeah, but the cat's name was just Church. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay, so we so got So it's it different. All right, anyway. <laughs> and then the other question was that Netflix... Yeah, the idea behind Netflix came in 1997 after the CEO was charged a $40 late fee for a VHS copy of what movie? I'm um, going to say 97 Titanic. I'm going to say Be Kind, Rewind. <laughs> no, it was that Apollo movie with Tom. Oh, Apollo 13. Yeah. Oh, Apollo 13. See, I was going to say um, uh, Pearl Harbor or something. When was no. Pearl Harbor? I think that was 97. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Because they weren't in the streaming business originally, were they? It was just DVDs. Right. They did yeah. DVDs. And in fact, they went to, the story goes, they went to Blockbuster Blockbuster offered them $50 million to buy them, you know. Yeah. And Blockbuster laughed in their face. Uh, Netflix, though. Netflix. No, Blockbuster Block laughed Because they thought Netflix. they were worth more than $50 million. No, Netflix was like, you can buy us for $50 million. Right. And Blockbuster said, we don't need you. That's not going to be a oh. thing. Oh. And look wow. at where they are now. Oh, my God. Oh. I do remember, uh, irrelevant, but still, when they did, when they switched over to streaming, there was a big controversy because they had two price points. And it looked for a while that they completely fucked the whole thing up. And people mm -hmm. were outraged and incensed. And well, then they, they were going to split them. And one was named something. And one oh, was going to be was Netflix. It. Right, right, right. But right. then they people, yeah. Just, yeah, they gave up on that. All right. Moving on, counting down the top 10 things that made us go, wow, we have reached number four. Number four. I read a book. You did? Oh, yes. <laughs> I did. I read it. It's called Commander in Cheat, How Golf Explains Trump. Because, you know, I, I like to call Trump the golf whore. He spent something like 20% of his time as president playing golf so yeah. far. This was the man who said he would be too busy to play golf and was mm -hmm. criticizing and Obama. Obama yeah, sure. But the other interesting thing, and I think the more the more revealing thing about Trump, is that he cheats. Yes. He cheats at golf every which way and, and how. every single person who's ever played with him says it. I think it's, he cheats at everything. He does, indeed. But this is you know, this is all part of the baffling picture for me of like how unless the Russians were helping you, could you possibly have become president? Because if you're a golf whore and you cheat at every game of golf, surely there must come a critical mass at which word about you being a cheating and a low down scumbag of a person is just gonna reach critical mass. Right. Well, but apparently but, not. But it isn't that the thing, though, where like evangelicals say, "Will we forgive him for his scumbaggery?" Right. Because that's what you the know, Christian Jesus, thing. Yeah, uh huh. And uh, but and they then, couldn't forgive for Michelle Obama for showing her shoulders. No, or Obama for wearing a tan suit. Right. Um, but then right. you know, also the base sort of thinks that, yeah, stick it to the man, right. you know, cheat, it's lie, about, steal, right. and we love all that. Right, because also the other, uh, for Trump, it's all about winning. It doesn't yeah. matter if you break the rules to yes. win. It doesn't matter yes. if you cheat to win, if you just win. And one of the fascinating things, it's not a very long book, it's like 200 plus pages, is that he claims to have won championships he's never even played. Yeah. He claims to be <laughs> champion at his golf courses by... I think he goes out and hits around before it opens and he makes himself the champion of the golf course 
which can never be beat. Also, well, the whole thing is like he, he named himself champion of, of tournaments that don't even exist. Well, he like, also, remember, he, he had that giant picture where he was Time Man of the yes. Year, and he was never Time Man of the Year. Right. And then he had, it was a fake magazine cover. Yeah, and he has a, a very famous like picture of Renoir or something hanging in his house. It's a complete fake, and the, the museum, like in uh, the... Louvre says we have that. What are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, No, I have it. You're lying. Right. You know, and Fake that's news. just that's him. And it's maddening. It is maddening. It is maddening. And and I mean, well, I mean, I'm I you know I've talked maybe too much about books on Trump, but uh, this one is really <laughs> just a hilarious read, even though it like, sort who's of the author stokes you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's a sports writer. I have to say, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know who the author is. I was I just was so engrossed. That was my gotcha question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so engrossed in the book, I couldn't tell you who the author was. But uh, Trump, and, and I guess in a way, it is a blinding glimpse of the obvious in that, yes, obviously, he's Rick a Rick Riley. Rick Riley, yes. And he just is, he, he, he is, he himself is somewhat shocked and appalled and still to this day a little dumbfounded the nuclear level or the wholesale extent to which he cheats, just cheats all the time. One of his favorite things is to hit a ball and then rather than wait for his opponent to play their ball, takes off in his golf caddy, finds their ball and throws it in the bunker. <laughs> <laughs> like, just sort of it's like something you'd see on a cartoon. It yes. Is. And it would be funny, I suppose, you like know, little in rascals. the same way that people thought Hitler was funny, you know, it would be yeah. funny if it wasn't. If it wasn't life, funny. If it yeah. wasn't real life. Exactly. Did people say Hitler was funny? They did. At the time there's Hitler's rise to power, people were like, oh, ridiculous. Well, I guess fool. Well, there was with those frenzied, foaming at the mouth speeches and all those history. I guess Charlie Chaplin and, did it and yeah. Bugs Bunny uh, and everybody. I mean, yeah. And but people thought he was a joke. They just didn't yeah. think he was posed any kind of threat whatsoever. And Trump I, I does. Right. Yeah. Trump poses what is the existential threat. Right. Right. Well, I, you know, even if it doesn't end in, you know, the same way that World War Two ended, it's still we have probably 20 years of people growing up thinking that that's cool and that's the way to act. Right. You know, and we have generations of kids growing up now that are going to be acting like little Trumps mm. in well into their adulthood. Exactly. Sorry to bring it down. Uh, let's move on to something cheerful like uh, number three, James. <laughs> Number three. Well, I don't know if that is cheerful because this is one of those <laughs> maddening stories that always drove me bananas in the early part of the century. The J.T. Leroy story. Yeah. Oh, dear God in heaven. I'm Why still did it. Why you so much? Because, and I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll okay. get to this. But the, yeah, 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 set yeah, the scene. Set the scene. Set yeah, the scene. The scene. Um, uh, there's a new movie out uh, uh, based on the J.T. Leroy story, which was in the 2000s. Uh, there was an up-and-coming writer, J.T. Leroy, who was supposedly this uh, hip little young kid who was a hustler. Lot he, lizard. He, yeah, he was. He grew yeah. up, and he, his mother was a whore, and he grew up like— is, Prostituting. A, Prostituting. He's, he was transgender. He was. Uh, he wrote a book called Sarah. He wrote uh, The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things. He did the beautiful, beautiful writing that did not jibe with the origin story of this. He he wrote sort of like Dave Eggers, on, you know, on acid. He was like he, an idiot savant, sort of, right? But self-educated. The, but kind but of there's no, self-educated writers write like Charles Bukowski. They write in staccato. They they don't they don't have this flowery Eton uh, Oxford English, oh. you know. That, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they don't write like that. And there was something oh. very weird from the very beginning about it. And I remember I met J T. Oh. Leroy. Early Early on, and at I, Book Soup, at Book Soup, he came in, and I talked to him in the back room, and I sort of cornered him, and I clocked right away that this was not who he said he was. I knew right off the bat that it wasn't that, that y y because he was the, the, the just explain. So, oh, so, the so, kid so, who so, went out as J T. Leroy so wasn't there, the writer. Right, right. There, there was a writer who was a woman right. named uh, Laura, and she found uh, her her sister in law, mm. and she started dressing the sister in law up to look like J.T. Leroy and would send it out, send the, the, uh, the Savannah as J.T. out to these readings in which, you know, Courtney Love and, and uh, you well, know. Well, that was the thing about an Asia Argento. Like, uh, everybody yes. just fell and over themselves. Every with the new... single, yeah, Winona Ryder. See, and... I think you're a little bit jealous, too. Well, I was <laughs> jealous. I was very jealous at the time because th those were the books that I wished that I would have been writing. Right. And the, pe the people were going bananas for it in a way that they didn't go bananas over Disco Bloodbath. And I sort of was like, that's what sort of gave me like the, the 
why I kept looking deeper and deeper into mm. the story. And then when I finally met JT Leroy and realized that it was a scam, and I kept saying this is a scam, and I was shouting it from the rooftops, and nobody was listening to me. And this is a movie coming out. And it's and, a movie and coming Courtney out. Love is in and, the movie. Yes, um, which is sort of which is great on her part I to know. be able to to look at herself and say, Laugh, look, kind yeah, of, yeah. Uh -huh. um, it stars Laura Dern as the um, the writer Laura, who is the actual JT Leroy, and Kristen Stewart is Savannah. Savannah, mm. a, aka JT. And is and, it based on the documentary? Yes. Yeah, because right, yeah. there was a documentary that unpacked the whole story. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which was really good. And I remember we talked about it at length mm. here. Um, but Kristen Stewart does a really good job of, of getting that weird sort of alien, like nutty little yeah. persona down. Um, uh, Laura Dern, like I said, Courtney Love. Um, also, Diane Kruger is in it, Jim Sturgis, and James Jagger, who is Mick's son, who's really very handsome. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really great cast. And also, it's directed by Justin Kelly, who did King Cobra. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And also, he's doing the Wheatsy Bat right now. I don't know if you know Wheatsy Bat. I is do a, not know the Wheatsy Bat. It's um, a very famous Los Angeles story or m book, late 80s. And it's um, sort of like what all the goths and the punks here in Los Angeles sort of model themselves after I this book, Wheat Sea Bat. It's, it's very classic. It's bad. It's, oh, my God. Yeah. You've read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah in yeah. fact, I interviewed her last year, uh, the author at um, DragCon. We mm -hmm. had a, a author's panel, and she came in to talk. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, she's really fascinating. So huh? be on the lookout for that. So is book. that like, what, are you, what is it, thumbs up, thumbs down? Well, it's it's thumbs up because it's such a crazy story. Right. Thumbs down because I knew it all along <laughs> and nobody listened to me. Do you still have your raccoon penis bone? I do have my right. yeah, because that was one of the things that he gave out is like, you get a raccoon penis bone right. if he liked you, he would send you. I a, have a raccoon penis. Yeah. Bone too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. J. G. Leroy hits theaters April twenty six. Oh, how do you see it? With some fancy preview or something. April 26th? No, it, I haven't seen the movie yet. Oh. I just watched the trailer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I just wanted to bitch wow. about the trailer. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, so moving on to number two. Number two. We have we have a first here on it's been all new things on the Wow Report. We have Trey Spiegel, contributor extraordinaire to the Wow Report. Yeah. Because uh, and I want to make sure I get this roughly right. Um, you know, Trey paints by numbers. He does paint by numbers. And he's been a champion of the form and the medium. And the legend of paint by numbers is a guy called Dan Robbins, who just passed away. I didn't realize there was a legend to a it. A legend. He passed away April Fool's Day, appropriately, oh, yeah. aged 93. And so we're going to get Trey. Wait, there have only been 93 years of paint by numbers? I thought that was a 19th century thing. There's been thing. less, less than uh, 93 I years. I thought it was like Edwardian or something. No, 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 no. So we thought we'd get Trey, the expert, the living expert on paint by numbers, guardian of the, um, what do you call it? The genre. genre. Thank you. Yes. To talk to us. Okay. By the miracle of technology. But I thought they were like like Edwardian schoolgirls with little lunch pails, and you would paint them in. Hi. 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 Oh my God. How are you? You look I'm like good. you've been face tuned. You look absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank you. Oh, shh. Sh sh I got my barking dog in my lap. I can see. Wait, we want to see the dog because you have the ugliest, cutest dog that I've ever seen in my life. I love your dog so much. Look at that dog. Oh my, it's like a gremlin. Oh my God, it's so cute. <laughs> Uh, how is everybody? Good, good. good. I love your backdrop. It's very nice. It's very pop, right? Yeah. It's, it's a painting of mine, yeah. Um, Thank you. So we were just talking about how that the the leader of the genre of, the, who originated the genre of um, paint by numbers passed away. What was his name? Uh, Dan Robbins. Dan Robbins. But you say that he wasn't really. Well, yeah, I, you know, it, it's... Um, it, it's whatever kind of press sort of takes the moment, then that's what everybody believes. But in fact, he um, helped popularize it in the 50s. Um, it's only been around he, since the 50s. Yeah, James St. James was saying. I thought that... The, paint the, by numbers were, were Edwardian. I was like, no. I thought there was like 30s, in, instances in the 30s of little schoolgirls with pails and... Well, you know what? What what's interesting? Um, the guy uh, Dan Robbins who passed away, he wrote a book in '97, um, 
And he says in the book um, that this guy, Max Klein, owned this company called the Palmer Paint Company. And he wanted um, Dan Robbins to come up with an idea to sell to adults using paint. So um, he proposed uh, this abstract number one, which I don't know if you, if you brought it, Fenton. Fenton has one of them in his office and has had for a while. That's I'm, I'm just collection. guardian of the paint by numbers picture. Trey says, you're coming back to get it, aren't you, at some point? Uh, uh, yes, well, that's, that's, quite a a gift. Valuable, that's quite a <laughs> valuable one. He presented that idea to Max Klein, and he said he hated it, but he liked the idea. So in Dan Robbins' book, which he wrote, this is Dan Robbins' book, ah. um, I'm going to read something that, from the book really quickly. Um, Max had his lawyers do a quick patent search to determine if the idea of painting by numbers was patentable, patentable or if it had already been filed for a patent or copyright. Sure enough, the search turned up multiple variations of by the numbers concepts. And yes, there were several paint by number filings dating back as far as 1923. I was crushed. Someone had already stolen my idea. So, but that didn't um, stop him from, from taking it and running. Well, so they went ahead with the idea. Um, to back up a little bit, in, in 92, I helped Michael O'Donoghue, who was the original Saturday Night Live Love head him, writer, yes. um, organize a show of his paint by numbers. He had about 200 of them. And um, so in 92, that show happened, and in 94, he passed away. And um, Max Klein had donated all, his family had donated all of his ephemera to the Smithsonian. So they got in touch with me, and I suggested doing this paint by number retrospective, which happened in 2001. Um, this is the catalog from that show. And they borrowed um, a bunch of my paintings. Dan Robbins was at that show, and there was a painting that I had in the show by a company called Picturecraft, and on it was a copyright that said 1949. Um, meanwhile, Dan Robbins is talking to the cameras and everyone saying, you invented paint by number, and he said, no, I didn't, Leonardo did, because apparently doing the Sistine Chapel, assistance would be given numbered areas to paint in. Oh. So, huh. I guess it does go back a little farther <laughs> than... Uh... But, that, but that wasn't a kit idea. So oh, right. In, in the Paint by Number catalog, this is in the Smithsonian show, it says this. I'm going to read this because this is more proof. Picture Craft Company kit, comp copyright 1949 to 1955, a manufacturer of art supplies dating to the 30s, James. Uh, the Picture Craft Company began producing paint by number kits in 1949, Promotional material suggests as early as 1943. The company's early kits were devised by Royce Karen, a commercial artist. Karen reportedly developed the paint by number idea during World War II as a therapeutic pastime for servicemen confined to the hospital. Oh, that's lacking interesting. The, lacking the financing to market the idea, uh, not until moving to Decatur, Illinois, and later Springfield, Illinois, Karen marketed his kits through picture craft. Huh. So those kits existed wow. in the late 40s, and uh, Craftmaster, which, which Palmer Paint Pump Company turned into, started manufacturing theirs in 1952. And at that point, they turned into a national craze. They sold millions of kits. Um, Dan Robbins was kind of a marketing genius. They See, that's would, the thing. He's a marketing yeah. genius, number one. Number two, he's very good looking, which I, yes. I didn't think hurt. And number three, often it's the case, you know, Alexander Bell didn't, Graham Bell or whoever, didn't invent the telephone. Someone else right. invented it. And television, it wasn't Sarnoff, it was someone else. Like, often these, these, these landmark and inventions. And Thomas Edison's great uh, bet Tesla. Noir. Tesla, yes. Yeah, right, Tesla. Uh -huh. And Whitney Houston wasn't the first to saying, I will always love you. <laughs> All the children are our future. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. Well, so. that's the thing, and that's the thing we've learned from the era of Trump. Just say it <laughs> again and again and again, and eventually it becomes the truth. Yeah. And yeah. In, on in Wikipedia, if you look it up, it says Dan Robbins just passed away and he invented paint by number. Um, when this happened, a, a BBC producer got in touch with me 
and I called them back and I said I was very sad that he had passed away and um doesn't I, I doesn't also, sound like you were that sad <laughs> well that was dot 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 and I told them this story sort of reader's digest version of the story and the producer said to me you know let's hold off on the interview <laughs> now <laughs> it didn't quite meet their idea of what had happened and if you look online there are scores of headlines that say creator of Paint by Number, inventor of Paint by Number. Well, Trey, thank you very much. I think we should postpone this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now I've been preempted. And, you know, I feel, you know, you sort of feel bad because, but this guy had an amazing life. He, he created some of the most incredible Paint by Numbers. He did one of the Queen of England, which is one of the most coveted ones. They're very, very hard to find. I don't have one. Um, he did that abstract number one and some other amazing ones. And, um, you know, he went on to do other things. He, like, worked for McDonald's, creating the Happy Meal promotion. Oh, my God. Well, bury the <laughs> lead, dear God. It's amazing. But, um, you know, what's going to be the headline when you die? Like, you know. Oh, God, please. I don't know. There would be no headline. <laughs> no, no headline whatsoever. <laughs> but um, if, you have, if you have something, just, you know, Keep saying it over and over again. Right, right. We invented um, television. We invented yeah, club kids. The club. <laughs> exactly. RuPaul, the inventor of drag. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Trey. Lovely to hear from you. Yeah. Did did you did Blake do my one of my trivia questions or not? Oh, we didn't get to them. Do you uh, have it? I do have it. Let's you, let's, you let's do it. We can take a break. So let's get the trivia question. Okay. What, what was the most popular paint by number kit ever? It was a famous painting. I'll give you a hint. Yeah. Hint, please. Yes. It's well, just, that's the fa that's it was that's a famous painting. Wait, oh, that was the hint. <laughs> oh wait, was that? Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, so we are gonna take a break now. Hey, uh, while you think about the answer, let me tell you this: RuPaul's Dragon is coming. <laughs> Tickets for the 24th, 25th, 26th, now at RuplesDragon.com. All right. You're listening to Wild World on Radio Andy Sirius XM. Thanks, Trey. Bye. 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 You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. We've been counting down top 10 things that make us go Wow. wow. <laughs> And before the break, we were talking to Trey Spiegel, uh, contributor extraordinaire to the WOW Report. Uh, we were talking about Dan Robbins, who sort of is remembered as the inventor of paint-by-numbers paintings, but he wasn't. And before the break, Trey had a question for us. Yeah, it was, what was the most popular paint-by-numbers kit ever? And the hint was, it's a famous painting. And then he sort of did this weird, like, thing, and I was thinking, like, Whistler's mother? What was, it, <laughs> what was he doing? What was that? Was he doing the potato eaters? What was it? Is that I think Mona it's Lisa. got to be the Mona Lisa. Oh. Bitch. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, was that that? Was that that smile it, he gave? Oh, it was an enigmatic smile. <laughs> I think that's what he was doing. Well, you're both wrong. Oh. It was The Last Supper. Oh. What was that hint then that he did? Was he acting like Christ? I don't know, but Trey did paint a, a large, a huge version based on a vintage 61 with the words, it's later than you think mm. on it. You know, uh, Andy Warhol's, the amazing thing, Andy Warhol's last series, World well, Last Supper series, oh, yeah. he bought that kind of like tchotchke type, 14th Street type plaster of Paris cast of Leonardo's Last Supper, and those were his last paintings huh. just so weird that that would be the last right. thing yeah. that you paint prescient prescient indeed okay we've reached the coveted number one spot number one what i i wish one? i wish tom Campbell was here yeah. <laughs> well james there is a meme going around is it a meme yeah it is a meme okay where you basically it's called hashtag ruin a film title by adding up your bum at the end <laughs> I know, apparently it's trending on Twitter. So, like Party Monster, up your bum. 101 Dalmatians, up your bum. <laughs> 101 Ramp Boys, up your bum. 12 Angry Men, up your bum. <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life, James, up your bum. <laughs> Pet Cemetery, up your bum. <laughs> Crazy Rich Asians, up your bum. <laughs> Come on, you give us one. <laughs> Gladly with the chosen peoples, up your bum. The bad seed, up your bum. <laughs> keep going, keep going. 40-year-old virgin, up your bum. 
Uh, the pianist up your bum. Hunt for the Red October up your bum. <laughs> Star booty up your bum. The Dark Knight Rises up your bum. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look now up your bum. <laughs> Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead up your bum. <laughs> close encounters of the third kind up your bum. <laughs> Although that should be actually close encounters of the third kind. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Boogie Nights up your bum. <laughs> Little Women up your bum. <laughs> Bobby Goldman up your bum. <laughs> the Man with the Golden Gun up your bum. I want to see that new movie, Her Smell. Her up Smell bum. up your bum. <laughs> <laughs> How about the Seven Year Itch up your bum? <laughs> <laughs> Something you can Aww. relate to. <laughs> there will be blood. Up your bum. <laughs> 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 James, this is for you. Ten things I hate about you. <laughs> None from you, James. I, I just, I'm shocked and appalled. <laughs> the at thing all of up your bum. <laughs> Psycho up your bum. <laughs> the fly up your bum. It's a wonderful life. Up your bum. <laughs> How many more do you have? <laughs> quite a long list. Well, the ones I really like are like, you know, the Sausage Party, Up Your Bum. Wait, you have literally <laughs> how many pages? I started writing that. You know, the interesting thing about this, <laughs> this meme is that it's actually been going, it actually, I think, started in America, and it's like, Up Your Ass. Yeah. Which is less... It, I mean, it's good. Yeah, it's just yeah. less good. Up and Your it, Bums it, makes it sound... It does, right? Eight and a half Up Your Bum. Oh, right. that's funny. Uh... The Cloudy the with a sound. chance to meet balls up your bum. Dawn of the Dead up your bum. Rear window. <laughs> Return of the Jedi up your bum. Uh, <laughs> Men in Black up your bum. Oh, uh, it's fine. Twilight Zone up your bum. <laughs> so that's all we have time for today. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, I guess you can make your own ones. You know um, the last time that Tom wasn't here? Yeah. Was when you you two accosted T.S. Madison oh, with the oh horrified God. her. I just break out in a sweat thinking about that show. <laughs> She'll never, she has never come back to World of Wonder since then. <laughs> <laughs> she is horrified of us. Yes, it's, I think it was the cannibal thing. That well, it's it. funny because I was going to do, there was an update on the cannibal killer. Oh, the, yeah. the cannibal what is it? Frat what kill. Is it? We'll have to wait until next week to oh, find yeah. out. Okay, well, tune in next week. Same time, same place. Until then... Go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow.